If you have your Bible with you, you can open it to James chapter 4. Uh, if you uh, feel like you're struggling uh, in your spiritual journey, if you feel like you are stuck in any way, uh, if you feel like you need a breakthrough, then I would encourage you to lean in this morning because God is going to speak to us. And so all of us that, that feel that way, uh, this message is uh, for us. Uh, you know, people are addicted to various behaviors uh, various uh, substances, but I would encourage us, if there's one addiction uh, that's good for us, is to be addicted to God's Word. Uh, that when we get in God's Word, then God's Word gets in us, and then we're all the better. It changes our day, it changes our life. So good morning uh, to all of you here in the auditorium. Good morning to everyone who's participating uh, live on uh, Facebook. I want to recognize our birthdays and our anniversaries uh, from this past week. On Tuesday, John Lewis celebrated a birthday, and Sean and Christy Carroll uh, celebrated their 20th anniversary. On Friday, Ryan and Stacy Williams uh, celebrated their 16th anniversary. Congratulations uh, to those couples. And then on Saturday, Bruce Combs, Liam Fisher, and Christopher Talman uh, celebrated birthdays. So, um, so uh, happy birthday to uh, each of you. And uh, I think there's a time where we're looking for good news. I think we have a picture of this. Uh, but if you didn't already know, our newest and youngest member of the West Orange family, Everett Michael Watson, uh, is uh, now with us. So uh, congratulations to uh, Billy and Lindsay and Caden. And uh, we're certainly uh, excited. And they've posted some pictures. And, and it's just great to, uh, to see that family bonding time uh, that they're already having. So, uh, so anyway, very, uh, very happy about uh, about that. A couple other uh, things and we'll get into our lesson. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, we, we think we know how God's going to work and, and sometimes we think, you know, maybe it's not God but it's us and things happen slowly. Sometimes they happen uh, quickly. And uh, we've been blessed here at West Orange. I was uh, mapping out some things uh, this past Friday and Saturday and praying over some things as far as like you know, different ministries and affiliates we have. And, and some of the things are things that we do off of this campus, but some of the things, as we've mentioned, have started happening back on this campus, three or four ministries on uh, Tuesday nights. And this past Tuesday night, uh, I was going around our different groups, uh, Narcotics Anonymous, uh, AA, uh, and, and then spent most of my time with the Pregnancy Center before a, uh, a meeting that we had virtually, but I just stayed up here. And, uh, and so I was in the AA meeting just a few minutes before they started, int reintroduced myself to them. And, uh, and one of the things that uh, one of the uh, participants there mentioned was, you know, it'd be great if, um, if, if here at West Orange you would start an Al-Anon group, you know, for, uh, to support families and friends of those dealing with, uh, with alcohol uh, addictions. And so I was like, oh, absolutely, you know, that, that would be great. And that's the only part I did, conversation. Didn't even pray about it yet. Uh, and then yesterday I get a phone call, and we're going to have a meeting uh, this Tuesday about a Monday night group starting here on our campus a week from tomorrow. So yet another opportunity for a safe space here in our midst for people to share in their struggles and, uh, and, to, uh, and, and to find that mutual uh, benefit and love. So anyway, sometimes God moves fast and looks like that's going to happen. And so uh, anyway, good thing. This story's a little bit longer, uh, so bear with me. If you're not into story, you're just like, get into James 4. We're about to. Um, but uh, Tuesday night, so I'm driving home, and it's, uh, I'm about to get home. I'm getting off at my exit. It's 930, and there's a car on the side of the road. And uh, the couple is outside of the car, so I roll my window down because I was about to turn right, and there they are. And I was like, do you guys need any help? Our car's out of gas. I said, well, if we turn left here, not even half a mile, there's a gas station. Would you like a ride? And I don't know how to take this, but when they were eyeballing me and looking at me, it's 930 at night, and they weren't so sure about that. And, uh, and the wife is like, yeah. And so he looks at her and he looks at me and he's like, no, we're okay. We're, we're okay. And I'm like, you're not okay, <laughs> you know. And so I'm like, well, you know, uh, I'm really, it's not an inconvenience. I was just headed home. My house is five minutes that way. Be happy to do it. And I can tell he really would rather not walk that distance and do all that and carry. So anyway, he kind of looks back. And so, uh, so anyway, so he decides, okay, I'll take you up on it. And so he gets in the car, 
And so we just have a short drive there. And imagine this, we're going to have a conversation while we're going. And so he's like, hey, what were you, you know, what were you out doing tonight <laughs> or whatever? And so I said, well, I'm actually a pastor at a church. And, uh, and so I was on our campus tonight for some different things and then, and then a virtual meeting. And so he's like, oh, okay. And he said, well, which church? And I said, uh, well, before that, he said, yeah, I'm a part of a church. You know, we haven't had our reentry yet or whatever. And so anyway, he, he said, um, he said, what church? And I said, West Orange Church of Christ. And so he said, oh, Church of Christ. He said, well, he said, uh, my dad is uh, from England and he actually came to Nashville and he got saved through a Church of Christ. He was baptized in a Church of Christ. I was like, oh, that's neat. I said, well, you mentioned Nashville. I said, uh, we just moved down from here from Nashville a little over three years ago. He said, I used to live in Nashville too. So it's like a second, you know, kind of connection. So we pull in, he goes in, you know, get a container and all. He comes back out, he's pumping the fuel. And then he says, what church did you say? And I said, well, West Orange Church of Christ. He said, I helped do a construction project there. He said it was unfinished. Wayne, you know where we're going. His name's J.D. And J.D. goes, he says, yeah, help with it. There was an unfinished part. I said, are you talking about the upstairs portion? He said, yeah. I, I said, you built my office. <laughs> so it's like of all the people to be able to help at 930 at night, there were those three connections. So it's like, Lord, that was kind of the punctuation mark on a long but good day. So anyway, um, I found that story interesting. Brett, did you find it interesting? If no one else did, at least Brett and I found it interesting. So um, anyway, all right, so uh, we started a series last week, Social Distancing from uh, Satan, and uh, we're going to continue with part two of a video that uh, Angie and Myla made. So let's uh, watch together. As a matter of fact, God even told us that if we touch that tree, we're going to die. Did God really say you must not eat from any of the trees in the garden? Well, all of them except, except one, and that tree is this one. What will happen if you eat from this tree? Well, if that will happen, we would surely die. Now, Eve knew exactly what God had said because she and Adam had walked and talked with him and she had been right there to, to know what he had said. It's important that we also know what God has said by studying his word. And it's important that we remember those things that we've read. The snake then asked Eve to think about it from a different way. He said, no, that's not right. No, no, God didn't really mean that. See, the deal is, God knows that if you take a bite of this fruit, then you're gonna know about good and evil, and you're going to be like God. Wow, that sounds great. You get to be smarter, get to know the things that God knows, and get to be like God. We all want to be like God, right? And so here we've got, the snake, and he's telling her things that sound so good. And I often wonder if Eve had paused and talked with God about this at that point, if she had just waited, if she would have made the same choice. I don't think she would have, but she thought on her own and she thought about how this was a beautiful tree, it says in the Bible. And she thought about how that fruit looked so good. It was so delicious. And she thought about the things that the snake had told her about being wise and about being like God. And she took that bite. Well, you won't surely die. God knows that if you eat the fruit of this tree, what's going to happen is you're going to be smart like him and your eyes will be opened. After she took that bite, she went and gave some to Adam, and he took that bite. And we know that they knew that they had done wrong, because it tells us 
in the Bible that they had tried to hide from God. We can't hide from God. God always knows our choices, and God made us free to make those choices. So before we make choices, we need to stop and think, what was it that God said about this? Because a lot of times, Satan does not look scary. He's masquerading like an angel of light. It's going to look like something good. Just like in the garden with Eve, the devil supplants God's word with us. The devil lies to us. The devil is deceptive. He's manipulative. And so I want to build on what Angie just shared there by asking us two questions. The first question is, what lies has the devil been telling you? In the last week, what lies has the devil been telling you? And then secondly, which ones, which lies are you believing? Which lies are you believing that he is telling you? Uh, lies in his arsenal are, are, are just many, 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 hundreds and hundreds of lies. Uh, among those uh, that he will often use are guilt and shame. Guilt and shame. Shame, guilt too, but shame even more, uh, keeps us locked in our circumstances. And that's the beauty of the story of Scripture is that we have a God who is merciful. We have this story of redemption. We have this God of love. God is love and thus love is a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. And He came to show us truth and to show us the way and to show us freedom and redemption and purpose and solution. So picking up in James chapter 4, verse 6. So uh, last week we looked at verses 1 through 8. This week we're going to look at verses uh, 6 through 10, maybe a little bit 11 and 12. So uh, James 4, verse 6 again. But He gives us more grace. That is why the Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. And so uh, the context here we've looked at is the danger of pride and the danger of being self-reliant instead of God-reliant. And as we learn in Scripture, Satan is the author of pride. And so he likes to plant seeds of pride in our minds. He relishes in seeing us become prideful in our posture towards God. And oftentimes, as we'll see a little bit today, that becomes manifest through uh, our relationship with His people. In fact, as we looked at the war going on last week and how it can happen in community and selfishness and pride, that uh, one of the biggest expressions of pride and this is talking about of believers. You know, we're not talking about the world. Yes, it's in the world. But for believers, is one of the largest expressions is in community. And again, as we know, community is not just who you're with at a given time. You know, we have different uh, circles of friends and associates and, and different ways we connect, technology as well as in person. And so look at what he goes on to say, James 4, verses 11 and 12. Brothers and sisters. So he's talking about brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Not worldly people. He says, brothers and sisters do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who's able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? We'll probably go deeper with that next week, but it certainly applies. Um, and it's one expression of that. Uh, but... James here, he's been talking about wars and people, you know, ambitions and against each other. And he's saying here, look, instead of taking the, the, the prideful road and being self-reliant, be God-reliant and humble yourselves and, and trust in Him and choose grace 
over grudges. You know, instead of having grudges and, and bitterness, he says to choose grace and, and, and holding our tongue over putting others down and condescending and judging and acting superior, and, and as he goes on to, to say there. So now look at verse 7 and 8 again, our theme verses for this three-week series. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you wash your hands you sinners and purify your hearts you double-minded there's a lot more we can and and possibly will say on that next week about being double-minded and all but it says here that satan as we need to you know as we think about social distancing and and practicing that on a a health and physical level uh, that scripture is emphatic in talking about how Satan roams about and that he seeks to influence us and, uh, and that he wants to contaminate us and he wants to get us sick and he wants to, to ultimately destroy us. And it says here that not on our own accord, but if we, if, if we in resisting the devil, let's talk about resisting, if we will submit to God and resist in our resistance that he will flee from us. It is a promise of God that He will flee, that He will distance Himself from you. Why? Because He sees God. He sees your posture with God. He sees you yielded to God, surrendered to God, submitting to God. He notices your relationship now with God. He notices your reliance upon Christ, you trusting and obeying Christ. So I want you to think about uh, with people that you would like to be closer to, you know, as far as, uh, you know, as, as far as friendship, as, as far as knowing better and having a, a stronger relationship with, that, that you can sit here, and that's a noble thing. I want to get closer to others, but, but there is no guarantee that they will get closer to you if you make that attempt, right? You could reach out, you could make a phone call, you could, uh, you know, say, hey, let's, you know, let's connect in some way. You could, you know, pour your heart out in an email or, you know, whatever it is to try. But there's no guarantee that, that they are going to reciprocate uh, your invitation and your effort uh, and your initiation of that relationship. So, for example, you know, the Bible here doesn't say draw near to Brian and he will draw near to you. It doesn't say draw near to other people and they will draw near to you. Sometimes we do, yes, sometimes no, but with God, it's always yes. We don't have to sit here and think, well, you know, if I seek to inch towards God, move towards God, you know, what's God going to do? Is he going to back away? Is is he going to distance himself from me? No, James says, you draw near to God. You want to have more intimacy with God, more friendship with God. Move away from yourself, away from the world, away from Satan and all the temptations and lies and distractions. He will draw near to you. I can make a promise to you this morning. It's not a promise from me. It's a promise from the Word of God. It's already been made. I'm just the mouthpiece. I promise you that if you will draw near to God this week, that He will draw near to you. And that you and I can be as close to God as we want and choose to be. That the onus is not on Him. That it is on us. In this season of our lives, our relationship with God is up to our own free will. God desires to pour into us. To fill us with all of Him. The challenge is for us to have the will and the faith to make the choice to submit and surrender to His reign, to His kingdom agenda, and to His purpose for us, for you, for me. He goes on to write in verse 9 and 10, Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. 
Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. That song we sang this morning directly from this verse. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. This kid's connection time, this video that we're about to view, I want you to pay close attention because Angie is going to illustrate both our problem and also the solution. Let's watch together. our kitchen. So this cup represents us, and this water is that spirit that has filled us when we've been baptized and given our life to Jesus. Looks clean. It is clean. It tastes pretty good. But what doesn't happen when we are baptized is it doesn't change everything around us. It's not like, poof, magically, all of the problems and the things that surround us go away. And we might think, well, I need to go out there and do something about it. I need to fix this. I need to do that because I want everybody to notice that I am doing some things that are different. Well, it's, it's good to do things that are good, right? We, we want to do good things. But what was the main word I said? That's right, it was I. If I'm doing those good things, because I want everybody to look at me and say, oh my goodness, look at her and look at all the good things she does and it's about me? Well, then it's not about God. And it looks good, but it stinks. That was vinegar, it stinks. Or maybe that's not something that is a problem for you. Maybe your problem is something like bitterness. That clouds things up pretty quickly, look at that. Or maybe it's jealousy. You might have a problem where you want everything that everybody else has and you're just so jealous of, of them. Maybe your problem is anger and you are angry and it causes you to do some pretty ugly things. Or maybe you don't have a problem with any of those. Maybe your problem isn't something that's bad in and of itself. Maybe your problem is that you like watching TV and you like playing sports and you love doing those things and so you start to do them all the time. Well, while those things aren't bad things, when they take up all of your time and they take you where you are away from God, that becomes a problem. This is not what it's supposed to look like to the world. They're supposed to look at us and see that reflection of Jesus. They're supposed to look at us and see that clean water. But that's not what it looks like right now. So what do I need to do? Well, Hebrews 10 22 says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. So if I come to worship and spend time worshiping with my brothers and sisters, God's gonna pour into me. And if I open up my Bible and I read and I do a daily devotion. And if I spend time in prayer each day, God's gonna pour into me. And if I spend time with my brothers and sisters in life group and Bible studies, God's going to pour into me. Look at this, not only is God pouring into me, but there's overflow. 
Look at this, it's overflowing and it's clean because we have to remember to draw near to God. And if we draw near to God, we're going to look like this too. I think that's a good stopping point this morning for us to reflect on that object lesson and to think about our own spiritual journey, to think about our own hearts, to think about our own decisions, to think about how the devil is working, but how God wants to work and how God wants to make everything new within us. Let's pray together. Lord, you already knew the prayer that would be on my lips for me and for us. Lord, you know everything about us. Lord, help us. Help us to be honest. God, help us to be authentic with ourselves. God, help us to resist the devil but not on our resources, but on yours. Lord, I ask that, that you would take control. God, for all of our out-of-control behaviors, all of our unmerited thoughts, Lord, I pray that you would take control. God, I pray that we would open ourselves up to you. God, that, that we would allow you to pour into us and to pour out the impurities that are within our spirit, that are within our faith and our heart. God, that we would draw near to you and that we would accept the promise of having you draw near to us and pour into us. God, help us to surrender. God, those of us with struggles right now, those of us that, that, that feel stuck and are needing a breakthrough, God, help us to turn to you and only to you. God, I pray that you would help us to dedicate our lives to you, to rededicate our lives to you. God, that, that today, that right now you would take control that tomorrow, that this week, that Lord, our prayer, that our will would be, that we're going to surrender to you, that we're going to do things your way. God, that we would receive your mercy, your forgiveness, your love. God, that we might be able to pour into others unselfishly. God, we rely on you. This is my prayer for me and for us. And God, may this be the prayer in our hearts and on our lips as we sing this song in worship to you. And I pray this in the wonderful and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand. My heart, my mind, my body, my soul, I give to you, take control, I give my body a living sacrifice, Lord.
again for joining us this week. It's great to see everyone. Have a wonderful week. Take care.